Raikou, the Thunder Pokémon, Entei, the Volcano Pokémon, and Suicune, the Aurora Pokémon. Welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional and I hope you are too. Today we'll be seeing which of the Gen 2 Legendary Beasts can defeat Pokémon Fire Red, including the Round 2 Elite 4, the fastest. For all of their similarities, their real differences lie in typing and base stats. They're all part of the slow growth rate, sporting pressure as an ability that doubles our opponent's PP usage. Raikou is definitely built the best in my opinion for a solo run with outstanding speed and special attack. Gen 3 is just before the physical special split, so Entei being more talented with physical attack will make for some interesting strategic differences, I hope. Suicune, though, is the bulkiest of the trio, and the slowest, but, I mean, slow is relative here. We're still gonna outspeed most opponents. They all have base stat totals of 580, which is lower than the box art legendaries, but matches other legendary trios like the Gen 1 Birds and the Gen 3 Regis. As usual, we're gonna let fate decide who plays first. Raikou will be 1 to 4, Entei 5 to 8, and Suicune 9 to 12. That's a 12. It isn't a 20, but hey, max rolls are always exciting. The Aurora Pokemon is gonna kick us off. I choose you, Suicune! <laughs> oh boy, do we have a lot to cover, so grab a drink, maybe a snack, and settle into this short movie about the legendary beasts. I've been refining my methodology lately, and as I announced in the last video, after trying six videos across multiple formats, I won't be using Zero IV Pokemon anymore. In these first playthroughs, I'll be using the same move restrictions, but perfectly average versions of the Pokémon with 15 in all IVs. Further details are in the description. Going into these playthroughs, it's Suicune that I initially predicted to be the winner. Water is just such a solid type in these games, and with access to Stab, or same type attack bonus Surf, and Ice Beam later, we have some great coverage. I choose the nickname Boreas, the purple-winged Greek god of the North Wind. Also, I've chosen a modest nature because, well, this one felt obvious. Our opening move is Bite, and in Gen 3, all dark moves are special. We smash through the rival, and I want to make a beeline to Brock. I came into these runs with a lot of assumptions about their outcomes, the first and most flawed of which was, I'm playing with legendaries, and this is gonna be a breeze. Well, as this game has a habit of doing, I'm in for some surprises later. Lately, I've enjoyed keeping our runners roughly even, so with a very speedy path to Brock, let's check out the others. We'll start with, um... Entei! To be honest, all three of these beasts have an identical path to Brock initially. All three start with Bite, and let's face it, when you're a legendary beast, the differences in our special attack stats aren't going to make an incredible difference in the early game. I choose the nickname Vulcan for Entei, shifting to the Roman pantheon. Vulcan was the god of fire, particularly its more destructive aspects like volcanoes and conflagrations. We defeat the rival just as easily, moving into the forest quickly. For Vulcan, I chose a serious nature, as we don't have access to great stab fire moves until later, and with a higher attack stat, I saw a fair amount of value in being a mixed attacker, at least in the early and mid games. Vulcan is just as quickly heading into Pewter City Gym, so we'll jump back one final time for Raikou. Although I'd initially predicted Suicune to win, Raikou was the one that I was most excited to play. He's the only one that gets access to Crunch later, and I do love me some Crunch. I've leaned into our special attack again with a modest nature. I have, like, zero motivation to use my physical attack with this thing. I nickname Raikou Thor. Oh wait, too many R's. Thor, the God of Thunder. Probably one of the most recognizable deities from the Norse pantheon. I may be Canadian through and through, but my family has a lot of Norse heritage. We still make Lefsa every year at Christmas. That's another easy lab battle with Bite, and Thor will be doing exactly the same thing as the other two on the way to Brock. Oofta, let's check out those Brock battles. We'll stick with Thor, because in this battle, Raikou sets the golden standard. You'd think that Brock with his Rock Ground Pokémon would have the advantage here, but Thor's outstanding special attack might just be the difference. Bite tears apart Brock's Rock types fairly easily, but that's including a crit. Given where our health was, in that final turn I'd wager that Onyx would have gone for Rock Tomb, possibly wiping us out without that crit. This luck reveals itself even more with our other two competitors. Vulcan has the least favorable matchup of the three. The AI sees Rock Tomb as more of a speed control than a damaging move. This means after taking out Geodude, the AI will prioritize moves like Tackle and Bind with Onyx. That is, until we're in range to knock out with Onyx's stab, super effective Rock Tomb. At around two-thirds health, it looks like we're in that range getting taken down. 
The solution is, at least, quite straightforward. We are playing a legendary after all. We just need a little bit more of an edge, so I defeat Camper Liam in Brock's gym, leveling us up to 8. This grants us some additional stats and brings us over a damage rounding threshold. The level of your Pokémon is factored into the damage calculation, but that calculation doesn't do decimals. Like, at all. This results in disproportionate damage gains as you level up, at any level that ends in a 0, 3, 5, or 8. As you can see with those few extra stats, this battle is much easier for Vulcan. Boreas faces a similar situation to Vulcan, albeit with a slightly better time because we don't share the weakness to Rock. I still had to defeat Camper Liam to defeat Brock without relying on excessive luck. I had an interesting point about natures here. Vulcan and Boreas share the same special attack stat, 90, but because of our modest nature, Boreas is able to take down Onyx in 4 compared to Vulcan's 5, barely. For the third time, Brock falls, so let's stick with Boreas since they played first. It's business as usual through Mount Moon, making sure to grab the Helix Fossil for Boreas. Because blue. Expect this reasoning with pretty much any blue Pokémon that I run. I like blue. Abadi Abadai. At level 11, all three competitors learn a stab move, which is Bubble Beam for Boreas. I'll complain about this in a second, but Bubble Beam is great right now. We're only level 14, and Misty's Starmie can be quite lethal, so I go for Rival 2 first. This ends up being an absolutely abysmal battle for me. Bubble Beam will be a 3-shot, so that could be better, but worse is, yep, Sand Attack. Boreas is going to proceed to miss six times in a row, so allow me to present this haiku. Constant sand attacks. Every one its own curse. Frustration unfurls. I ran out defeating one trainer in Misty's gym, then jumping right back into battle at level 15, again over a damage rounding threshold. We just barely don't get the two shot, but without missing all of our attacks, we're much more successful against Pidgeotto. Bulbasaur is the big question mark. We're weak to his stab vine whips, and if he puts us to sleep, we're pretty much just at the whims of the RNG. The next move was to try to go to Misty with Boreas, but before jumping into the next gym, let's check back with the others. Vulcan has been having an easy time since we last checked in. I make sure to grab the Dome Fossil on the way through Mount Moon, but leaning on experience of Boreas's run, I cleared an additional trainer on the way through to level up to 15. Remember a second ago I said I was going to complain about Bubble Beam? Well, it has a base power of 65, whereas Vulcan and Thor only get access to Ember and Thundershock, which only have 40 base power. What is with that? This lacking damage output costs us too many turns against Rival 2, and his Squirtle Stab, Torrent Boosted, Super Effective Water Gun brings us down. Vulcan is definitely not going to have a good time against Misty, so after my second wipe, I defeated the trainers in Misty's gym, leveling to 16. Not over a damage rounding threshold or anything, but hey, we're a legendary. A level's worth of stats could be the difference. Also, luck plays a factor. When we flinch Squirtle every turn, the battle is much easier. Once his ace is taken care of, we can clean up his team quite easily. Vulcan is the only one of the three that I'll be pulling down Camper Flint with on Route 25, in order to grab TM43's secret power. He's the only one that I'll be attempting to use physical moves of any sort with, and I'm hoping that it's going to help with Misty. The little bit of extra experience is nice, but now we're ready to face Misty with Vulcan. I'm not feeling great about it, but let's jump back and check Thor's path real quick. Thor as well grabs the Dome Fossil on the way through Mount Moon. With Thor though, we have a type advantage against Misty, so we can finally jump right into that battle. Unlike Vulcan, Thor has not cleared any additional trainers. We have a type advantage against Misty, let's check it out. Stab Thundershock is super effective, but otherwise it's exactly as powerful as Bite is, both with effective powers of 60, still lower than the base power of Bubble Beam. I was mildly surprised by Staryu choosing Water Pulse, as usually Staryu prefers Hardening in the first turn. Then with Starmie, I've switched to Bite, just barely missing the one-shot with a critical for 120 effective power. That little bit of extra damage from Staryu seems to have pushed us over the edge in this first attempt though. Granted, we are level 14 compared to Starmie's 21. Staryu hardens this time, saving us a little bit of damage. Okay, I think we're good now, especially if we crit Starmie again, this time taking her out immediately. Well, that was easy. Let's jump over to Boreas and save Vulcan struggles for last. As the water type, Boreas will resist Misty's heaviest hitting attacks. We don't have a great offensive option ourselves, but once again with Bite on our side, we have a reasonably easy time. Our bulk allows us to soak up a fair amount of damage quite easily, and including another crit against Starmie, we have a first try victory. 
The crit didn't really seem necessary though, I feel like we had this one in the bag. But um, bad news for Vulcan, those water pulses are gonna hurt him a whole lot more. Remember that Vulcan has cleared Rival 2 and completed the Nugget, Bridge, and Bill portions of the plot. At level 21, our secret power is just barely not dealing enough damage to take out Staryu. We managed to bring it down without taking a hit, but Starmi is always the worrisome one. Worrisome indeed, as we both seem to be dealing around half to each other. But Starmi's faster, so Starmi wins. My solution after seeing that battle? Run away! We have the ability to come back to this battle after completing a little bit more plot, and Vulcan, like so many fire types before him, needs a little bit of help for Misty. I start my journey south to the SSN and we're quickly facing another rival battle. I feel like this battle properly demonstrates that we're not having a bad time against Misty for lack of raw power. She's simply a really challenging task for Pokémon with a weakness to water to overcome. And overcome her we must in order to progress with the game at all. Vulcan absolutely carves through Rival 3's team and is unable to access Lieutenant Surge without cut, so we have to backtrack to attempt Misty again. It turns out, as is the case with so many situations in a solo run, that it was our speed that changed everything. We have the power to knock out Staryu in one shot now, and at 55 speed, we now also outspeed Starmie, who has 53. This puts control of the battle into our hands, quickly crushing Misty Starfish between our meaty mandibles. Finally, everyone has two badges, and Vulcan now stands at a crossroads. Instead of heading south to defeat Lieutenant Surge and collect our third badge, I'm instead gonna head east from Cerulean along Route 9. This will lead us through Rock Tunnel and into the mid-game. We'll have to backtrack for Surge, but I feel like it's more time efficient to simply go back for him via Saffron in a few minutes. On the other side of Rock Tunnel, I'm diverting south to the gatehouse to grab TM27 Return. This will be Vulcan's best physical move, and this will be the only playthrough in which I grab it. Then, after completing the typical mid-game chores, I've grabbed HM2 Fly, but I can't use it yet. So it's time to start heading back towards Vermilion, but I decided to do a few things along the way. First of which is starting the rocket plotline in the game corner. Vulcan definitely feels the most lacking coming into this midsection of the game. Our moveset right now is Ember, Bite, Secret Power, and Roar. Yup, these are the best moves that we can get right now. I'm really looking forward to Flamethrower, which we can either buy at the game corner for 80,000 Poké Dollars, or wait until level 51 when we learn it naturally. Hmm, by then we'll likely be done the gym challenge, so I'm probably just going to be saving my money for Flamethrower to accelerate this mid-game. I clear out the rockets, then before heading to Vermilion, I'm going to once again divert south to take on Erica. She's the first gym leader where Vulcan actually has the advantage over the others, with her grass types being weak to fire. As Vulcan prepares for a quick third and fourth badges, let's jump back to the others for what would be a more standard route. It almost feels weird popping back to Thor. We went from Vulcan at level 30 with a solid foothold in the mid-game to Thor only 8.5 minutes into the run at half that level. Electric types have a tendency to struggle in Fire Red solo runs, but Thor hasn't stopped yet. The rival was a somewhat tough choice to make concerning which teams to go with. Water versus Grass and Fire versus Water seemed easy enough, but with Thor we're kinda strong against all of them, maybe barring Venusaur. So, simply in the interest of facing all three teams in the video, Thor will be facing Charmander. We take a bit of a beating, but defeat Rival 2 on the first try. Thor's strategy as we prepare for the mid-game is fairly different from Vulcan's. Both Thor and Boreas will be leaning 100% into their special attack, with Thor's coverage moves being electric and dark. None of these initial runs will be gathering an army of Meowths, as hidden powers will not be featured. Um, probably, but we'll come back to that later. Thor finds himself with another easy rival victory, and I realize that I've been playing this run in shift mode instead of set. Whoops, let's just correct that. Okay, we're now ready to take on our third badge, so let's quickly catch up Boreas. Boreas is back facing Rival 2 after defeating Misty. Even with our slightly higher level though, it means absolutely nothing when Bulbasaur decides to go for Sleep Powder. Then we'll just sit there, peacefully resting while getting beaten to a pulp and taken out by Vine Whips. It gets to the point where I feel I need to grind a little, leveling up to 18. We're now on our 7th reset of the run, and this is the disadvantage to playing first as I'm still feeling out the game as a whole with these Pokémon. At level 18, including a first turn wake up against Bulbasaur, we can see a successful battle. We can then skip right ahead to Rival 3. As the bulkiest of the trio, it's definitely seeming like Boreas is going to take the longest to come into their own. Even Vulcan's type disadvantage through the early game didn't slow us down too, too much, while Boreas's lacking damage output against Bulbasaur has been costly. 
Against Rival 3 though, you can start to see that power dynamic shifting. With that bulk too, I made sure to grab TM44 Rest from the lower deck. Now with Rival 3 cleared, we're ready to take on another gym, but it's Boreas' turn to face a type disadvantage. As it turns out though, we are starting to find our power even this early in the game. We're slower than the others, sure, but water is just such a solid typing in these games. We're outsped by Voltorb, tanking a stab super effective shockwave while taking him and Pikachu out with Bubble Beams. His Ace Raichu is the biggest threat, but our Bubble Beams are still doing well over half, while his shockwave did only 30 damage. That's like a third, which is amazing. So, even with another turn in reserve, we can quite safely bring down Raichu with one more Bubble Beam. Well, that wasn't bad at all, let's bring back Thor. Thor, who has seemingly had the easiest time with the game so far, actually had the hardest time against Surge. Bite may be a special move, but it's classified as making contact, so we're constantly at risk of being paralyzed by static. Our best move against him is Bite, and much like the water mirror match Boreas held against Misty, this electric mirror match protects us from a large portion of the incoming damage. I just bite, bite, and bite some more, with my cherry berry activating but not preventing us from being paralyzed. There were a lot of turns in this battle. But we win! Sweet! We're ready to check back with Vulcan again, but they were poised to defeat someone else for their third badge. With our type advantage, it only made sense to tackle Erika while we were in the neighborhood. Our best move in this battle, though, remains Ember, which, against some third-stage Pokémon, is starting to feel a little lackluster. Lackluster or not, though, it's effective. Vulcan blazes through Erika's team, collecting a third badge, and we're immediately ready to grab another. What can really be said about Lieutenant Surge for a level 32 Entei? Secret power alone is enough to smash our way through the Electric Leader's team as well. We're powerful enough at this point that we're almost capable of one-shotting his ace Raichu, which only using a base 70 power normal move is fairly impressive. We collect a quick fourth badge on the way to Pokémon Tower. Priority number one on the way to this battle is overriding secret power with Return. Return's power is based on your friendship with your Pokémon, and at this point in the run we've crested over the threshold when Return does more damage than secret power. By a little bit. I can use it to rock his Pidgeotto and Wartortle, switching to special Bite for Growlithe after being hit with an Intimidate. It's then Ember for Execute and another Bite for Kadabra in the back. At this point in the game, all three beasts were feeling like they had an answer for pretty much anything the game threw at us. Rival 4 falls, making our next goal Sylphco. My mid-game philosophy with all three is that I'm going to be doing some item collection in Sylph. I felt that all three needed a treat from the game corner, and that meant gathering a non-inconsequential amount of money. Also, things have been a little disjointed. Let's check out how our three runners are doing so far. Thor had the fastest Brock split, and has not yet yielded a single second to the other two. Boreas has been doing okay so far, but not without a sticky point here and there. Poor, poor Vulcan, though. Representing the fire type is a rough go in Kanto games, but despite being 15 minutes behind Thor when defeating Surge, Vulcan does already have a solid foothold in the mid game and an extra badge. There's a lot of game left, and Thor has some item collection to do. Let's check back with Boreas. Boreas has been busy clearing the mid game, but check out that moveset Bubble Beam, Water Pulse, which we got from Misty, and Rain Dance now as well, which we learned at level 21. In the rain, our stab water moves are boosted even further, so although Thor has been lightning fast so far, the North Wind is another power entirely. The water type is so good in these games. We can blast through Boss Rocket, and I will definitely not be pursuing Erika and our fourth badge at the moment. At level 41, we'll learn Aurora Beam, giving us a super effective option against her. That still feels like an eternity away, though, as I turn east to follow the Rocket plotline. Rain Dance doesn't help us much against Ivysaur, though. There's no doubt that Boreas has the roughest matchup against the rival in the early game. That's due entirely to Sleep Powder, and even Leech Seed can be quite pesky when comboed with the Sleep. In the first battle against Rival 4, we see exactly that unfold, with the damage accrued while sleeping overwhelming us in the end. I stubbornly reset a few times before deciding to stick my Chesto Berry onto Boreas. This was just too much. Rival 4 is usually a wash in these runs. With the Chesto Berry equipped, we wake up against Ivysaur, giving us enough of an edge to bring him down while still at just below half health. Gyarados then thrashes, thumping and thudding us. Thankfully, our thick-skinned beast survives at 1 HP, bringing him down. 
Oh boy, Bubble Beam takes out Growlithe, come on, and with a critical bite, we finish Kadabra, and I don't think that that crit mattered. Phew! Phew, sweet. Well, now that that's dealt with, Boreas is going to be heading for Sylphco to collect items as well after clearing Pokemon Tower. That'll keep them busy while we zip back for Thor. With Thor, we're actually way back in Lieutenant Surge's gym. The very first thing that I did after defeating Lieutenant Surge was teach Shockwave to Thor. It won't miss and has 20 base power more than Thundershock. It's almost like having Electric Bubble Beam. Thor's dominant performance continues all the way through the next section until we hit a slight snag against Giovanni in the Rocket Hideout. Bite handles his rock types well enough, but it's his Kangaskhan, <clears throat> excuse me, Kangaskhan that gets the better of us. I want to note my defense was not dropped by either Pokemon leading up to this point, and his Mega Punches hurt. They hurt a lot more than I could hope to outdamage at this point. Fortunately, the folly of the villains in this universe is that they all kinda suck at Pokemon. Love, man. All you need is love. With Kanga deciding that we looked much more like a tasty snack, going for bite instead of a punching bag, we do much better. If you check out that move side, though, aside from upgrading to Shockwave, nothing has changed all game. Thor does one thing, but we do it well. Giovanni, though, is gonna be a perpetual problem for Thor. Thor as well is going to be skipping by Erika on the way to continue the Rocket plotline. I mentioned earlier that Raikou was my favorite to play, and honestly, I'm starting to wonder if it's my favorite to win. Look at this absolute dominance in this battle. We're the same level as the others, just with a winning move combination. Back that up with great speed and the highest special attack of the trio? Oh yeah, Thor brings the thunder. Well, maybe not. I, I don't like the thunder only has 70% accuracy. Here we are, with every runner back in Silphco and our runs united once again. And it's time for them to go, each in a new direction. These beasts are infamous for being spread across the continent at all times, after all. While Thor gathers items, I'd like to get back to my thought about the Game Corner TMs. Thor straight up doesn't learn Thunderbolt. Okay, need that one. Boreas gets Aurora Beam, but at only 65 base power, it definitely falls short compared to the 95 of Ice Beam. Okay, that's on the shopping list. The only one I hummed and hawed about was Vulcan's Flamethrower. We do learn it organically at level 51, but that's so far into the game that I felt getting it early from the game corner would be faster. We'll see. With that said, it's time to check out Rival 5 for the first time. Thor has had by far the easiest time with the rival to this point, and this battle will be no egg exception. We're slightly underleveled, but despite that stab, super effective shockwaves absolutely rip through his Pidgeot and Gyarados. Bite misses the one shot against Execute barely, so we get paralyzed, which is never great. Alakazam only knows Future Sight as an attacking move, but we are on the clock here. Even with our paralysis and Charizard hitting a stab flamethrower, we cling on at five hit points for a first try victory. Killer. As I mentioned, the routes are about to diverge in much different ways than they have up to this point so far. Thor cleans up the rockets and heads for Sabrina next. Um, there's actually a problem with that. His name is Giovanni. Check out that moveset. Yep, hasn't changed. The problem that Kanga posed in the past has not gone away, now being added to by the threat of Nidoqueen and my abhorrent luck with Poison Point. If there's one thing that the Marvel movies got right, it's that Thor may be incredibly powerful, but he can be a little fragile at times too. That defeat felt definitive enough that I decided to head over to Celadon first to purchase vitamins focusing on special attack and defense, and then go to the roof to grab TM33 Reflect. This will half incoming physical damage while the screen is active. Sounds like a plan to me, as I think forward to the plethora of earthquakes awaiting us in the late game. Thor also hasn't cleared Erika, so I quickly pop down to defeat her. It isn't really an interesting battle at all, though. I'd been tempted to come here on the first pass of Celadon, but didn't really feel confident in the power of Bite alone. Well, now with a few levels, Bite alone does just fine. Thor collects their third badge, and it's time to move south to Fuchsia City. Honestly, we're a legendary. There's nothing that I really need to say along the next path. I love how each of these three are struggling in different ways despite their similarities. It's so interesting to me. I feel like with Reflect, Thor might have handled Giovanni right now, but I figured I'd clear the next section of plot to gather a bit of experience and make my life easier. Our next major battle is against Koga. As it turns out, our damage output at the moment is in a perfectly awkward spot. I mean, not against coughing, I delete them immediately, but the problem lies in Muck. 
He's Koga's most defensive Pokémon in the special stat, and I just keep knocking him down to a sliver while Koga keeps healing him. After a few rounds of this, and with some poison damage slowly adding up, Thor takes another reset to the Poison Master. A couple, in fact, but in this battle, I feel like I've got it dialed in. Maybe. I do have a Pecha Berry equipped, and while I dance between Bites and Shockwaves trying my darndest to keep him out of heal range, it ends up saving us from poison. I had it equipped last time too, but I get poisoned a lot. His Ace Wheezing in the back is then another two-shot with Shockwave. Five badges for Thor. Instead of going back to Sylphco, I felt it was better to head to Cinnabar next. We have Lapras after all, being defeated by Giovanni and not Rival 5. I'd chosen to not give Thor any Carbos for speed, and leaning on experience that I gained in Boreas's initial run, I was well aware that we'd need a little bit of grinding. Well, I'm hungry for Thunderbolt, so where better for cash, experience, and speed EVs than Blaine's Gym? I defeat every trainer on the way to face the man himself. While Thor does a bit of grinding, it's been a while since we last checked in with Vulcan. We left Vulcan and Sylph, and we're now ready to take on Rival 5. We do admirably against his lead Pidgeot, but against Blastoise, we are woefully outgunned. Just like Thor, our moveset has not altered one bit. Granted, Blastoise's best water move remains Water Gun, but that's more than he needs to douse our flames. I'm feeling a little bit down. Maybe I'll try some shopping! After selling everything excessive, I carefully purchased vitamins, maxing our special attack only, and using the Carbos that we collected. I was careful to leave myself with 80,000 Poké Dollars, because I'm grabbing that early flamethrower. No, not Ice Beam, flamethrower! I teach it immediately, and then leave to see how that affected the Rival 5 battle. Oh, plenty against Pidgeot, but, well, pretty unsurprisingly, not that much against Blastoise. A new fire move definitely did not cure our weakness to water, but nice try, Blaine. I mean Vulcan. This battle is still feeling quite hopeless, so we tuck tail and dash down to Fuchsia to challenge Koga instead. I have to take a quick moment to thank all of you in the comments for your support and feedback. If you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps the channel to grow. Recently in the comments, this little shortcut in Koga's gym was revealed to me. After like 20 years of playing this game, I had no idea it was here. Thank you all for helping me to be a better player. Let's beat up Koga. I know that a common theme throughout this run so far has been the weakness of the fire type. But don't get me wrong, that's just in the challenges that we're facing in this game. Stab Flamethrower, even from Vulcan's weaker special attack, is a mighty weapon. So mighty, in fact, that going up against Koga the first time, that's all I do is spam Flamethrower. It almost works, too, if it wasn't for that meddling poison damage. I'd say we were one turn away from victory there, but it got the better of us. Switching to a Flamethrower Bite Flamethrower Wombo Combo against Muck does just the trick though, avoiding a bunch of shenanigans and keeping our Pecha Berry intact. Once his Ace Wheezing is back, it's a Bite Flamethrower Combo for him as well. Am I the only one who's always felt that the fire move should have some low percent chance of instantly exploding, coughing, and wheezing? I'm not exactly sure what the LEL of coughing smoke is, but surely it's not that outside of the realm of possibility. With a couple of extra levels under our belt, and no free Pokémon to surf with, I decided to go back to Rival 5 and Sylph again. We're two levels higher than last time, but this time I'm also coming in with a secret weapon. It was the Slugfest with Blastoise that was our downfall before, so including those wee extra stats and being over the next damage rounding threshold, I've also brought in a Citrus Berry. This just barely gives us enough of an edge to survive Blastoise and then carve through the second half of his team. Vulcan then has no problems with Giovanni, being sure to scoff slightly at Thor's failures as he passes by. Next, we challenge Sabrina. <laughs> Sabrina has a big flaw in her team, and it's a flaw that I exploit often. Her team is quite physically frail, and with Vulcan's higher attack stat, we're absolutely going to take the opportunity to flex a little bit. Return reaps her team, including throwing in a stab super effective flamethrower for Venomoth. Her ace Alakazam gets caught in a healing loop, but we're under no threat here. Vulcan's path is going to lead him across the sea next. Wait a minute, Boreas? Are you heading this way too? Boreas has collected their items in Sylph, but yeah, Rival 5's Venusaur? No way, not right now anyway. In the Safari Zone, we see a big upgrade that all three will need to collect, but only Boreas can truly take advantage of. The dominance of the water type continues with HM3 Surf, in my opinion, the most powerful water move in the game, as an HM. In order to cross the sea with Surf, though, we have to defeat Koga. 
Stab Surf removes his lead coughing from the battle immediately. Against Muck, I set up Rain Dance, further increasing the power of our water moves. Stab, Rain Boosted Surfs, then make short work of the rest of Koga's team. We stick Weezing into another healing loop, but it's shortly lived and we win. That's only Boreas's fourth badge though, and our type disadvantage here leads me to seek brighter burning opportunities across the sea. Because yeah, if I hadn't mentioned it, Venusaur. Not happening. <laughs> Being the slowest of the group, I've also cleared all of the trainers in Blaine's gym. The only thing that I had to decide in this battle was whether or not I felt Surf was enough or if I should boost it with the rain. Turns out, Surf is almost enough until Arcanine, who just barely clings on. Fine, I'll set up the rain and win. That was a wicked easy badge, but again, it's only Boreas's fifth. Given that these are Gen 3 remakes, we have the main game, but also the post game. Helping Bill and doing the first section of the Sevi Island plotline is not required for a round 1 finish, but since I target round 2 in my runs, I find it better to do this section right now. We then quickly whoosh back after wrapping that up, and it's time to go take on some of that plot that we left behind. After grinding in Blaine's gym, we leveled to 41 learning Aurora Beam, so our first task is back in Celadon at Erica. So, um, at level 44, with super effective Aurora Beam on our side, Erica is a goner. I really don't have that much to say here. I hope you're all enjoying the beasts so far. I know I am. Which is your favorite legendary beast? Let me know in the comments. With Erica's grass types out of the way, we're ready to take another crack at the rival's grass Venusaur. As it turns out, going off to clear all of that additional plot was a good idea. We're a substantially higher level now, and with Aurora Beam on our side, things are looking much better. So much better, in fact, that we two-shot Venusaur while soaking his stab, super effective Razor Leaf and remaining in Green Bar. Gyarados does a number on us too, but you know what? This is a victory, and I'm taking it. Next is Sabrina. Oh, did I forget Giovanni? Stab Surf. Just like against Sabrina here. I set up the rain while Kadabra sets up Calm Mind. Sorry buddy, that's not gonna save you. Stab Rain Boosted Surf then one-shots Sabrina's entire team. That's another super easy badge for Boreas, and guess what? The final encounter with Giovanni remains just as easy. <laughs> I find myself once more in a battle where mashing A is enough to win. In fact, this one is even more simple because I don't even have to bother with that whole left down nonsense to set up rain. Nah, we just wash away Giovanni's team with ease. Boreas completes the gym challenge in under an hour at 59 minutes and 1 second. We might as well just get Boreas ready for the league quickly. Before challenging Rival 6 on the way to Victory Road, I fly back to Celadon once again. This time, it's Boreas' turn to go shopping at the game corner, buying TM13 Ice Beam. Something too that I haven't mentioned is that defeating Sabrina granted us TM4 Calm Mind. All three learn this naturally at level 1, but um, that's not very helpful, so I'll use the TM to teach it instead. I honestly have an incredibly messy battle against the rival here. I'm just testing my new moveset, missing ranges, and getting a little lucky against Venusaur. I set up late, but set up two Calm Minds while taking Razor Leafs, but at least I freeze him. We're low on HP, but at plus two we can work through his team quite effectively after defeating him. Sweet! That's a wrap for Boreas's pre-league. Let's catch up with the others. We catch up with Vulcan first, grabbing an upgrade from Pokemon Mansion on Cinnabar. I also grab TM11 Sunny Day in the Safari Zone to go along with this. The coverage of the beasts is as follows. They get normal moves and the awful Iron Tail, but then it's Raikou with Electric Dark, Suicune with Water Ice, and Entei covers Fire and Grass, but our Grass move is Solar Beam which takes a turn to charge. It skips that requirement while the sunny day is active, which also happens to power up our fire moves. It's a great synergy, but is it going to be enough to win the game? Let's check out Blaine. Vulcan's already defeated Sabrina, so I've also taught Calm Mind. I mean, how much was Roar really doing for us? Keeping in step with the others, I've also defeated every trainer in this gym. I had planned on using more returns here, but we're actually out of them. Well, let's set up Calm Minds and Bite instead. Arcanine gets annoying using Roar, ha, the irony, but swapping Pidgey back out I can win the battle. It cancelled our setup, but we didn't need it at that point. We pretty much felt immune to anything Blaine could throw at us, so that's an easy 7th badge for Vulcan. I then help Bill, and we're quickly facing the final gym leader. He's a decidedly bigger problem for Vulcan. I'm coming back to that poor disadvantage of fire Pokémon. I can't complain about it too much, as in the upcoming section there are about 7 million Earthquakes, which Thor is also going to have to navigate. 
We're actually dealing great damage to Giovanni, but he is too, and the myriad of stab super effective earthquakes is more than Vulcan can handle. This is actually going to hold us up quite a bit. Here we are six resets and as many minutes later. I've done a little bit of grinding in the gym here, and the only reason that I think I won this one? The first turn flinch against Rhyhorn. If not for that, our speed would have been reduced and I would have been subjected to all of those earthquakes again. He healed while I snuck in a calm mind and then the battle was mine. Lucky, but man, Earthquake City and it's only gonna get worse. I'll post up the splits for the gym challenge once we catch up with Thor, but wowza, for how differently these three found themselves handling the game to this point, this sure has been an interesting one to collect data points for. Vulcan is going to have a relatively easy time here. The reason is because his Blastoise still only knows Water Gun. I use this to set up some Calm Minds and then win the battle. Let's finish the gym challenge with Thor so we can jump into the Pokémon League. At level 41, Thor learned Spark, replacing Shockwave. It's only 5 base power more, but also has a chance to paralyze, which I do enjoy. Thor is starting to experience a few problems though. We haven't been able to defeat Giovanni and Sylph yet, so we don't have access to Calm Mind. I actually get quite lucky in this first battle, getting multiple paralysis assists, but Arcanine ends up bringing us down. After a couple of resets, I came back to Sylph to attempt Giovanni again. It still isn't really going well either, but, um, I hate to say look at that moveset again, but it still hasn't changed. Wait a minute, didn't I buy Reflect? Nah, so after a bit of training, I'm facing Blaine again. The extra couple of levels seem to do the trick though, as we're able to electrify Blaine's team quite effectively this time. These first playthroughs are always rife with learning opportunities, that is for sure. Upon defeating him this time, it's Thor's turn to go help Bill in the Sevi Islands, gaining that little bit of extra experience. Alright buddy, we're level 46 now, let's see if you're still as tough as I think you are. Turns out, yup, definitely. I no longer have my Pecha Berry, having used it against Koga, so when I get my, you guessed it, first contact turn poison point activation, I'm already feeling in trouble. But as it turns out, with legendary Pokémon come legendary stats. Somehow, we managed to make it through this battle this time. I was even getting super worked up at this point, opening my bag instead of moving the cursor right to bite. Frantic bees later, and we defeat Giovanni while hanging on with a single hit point. Phew. It's against Sabrina that I start feeling like a strong Pokémon again. We're still using the move that we started with, Bite, but it's cleaning house. Sabrina was brought into being long before the Dark-type existed, and she was not prepared. Now collecting our seventh badge, we have one to go. Unfortunately, it's another Giovanni battle. Ah, let's go deal with some more Earthquakes. Let's take a quick moment to consider Thor's options here. Bite is our best move until level 61 when we learn Crunch. Hmm, do I really want to grind to level 61 for Giovanni? Oof da Thor, what are we gonna do here? I try my hand at the battle seeing what Bite does by itself, not nearly enough on its own. So, let's get cleverer. Well, it takes a minute first. Four minutes and three resets later, I've done a little bit of training leveling up to 51. Learning Reflect? Because why would I bother with the TM that's been in my bag for like 30 minutes? At this level, we now one-shot Rhyhorn, super, and then against Dugtrio, I set up Reflect, then Calm Mind as many times as I possibly can through Dugtrio's Onslaught. Bite alone? Nah. Plus two bite? Plenty enough. Thankfully, this wasn't as much of a roadblock as I was fearing, leaving rival six before the league. Thor continues the trend of having the easiest time against the rival. This is the only run that I haven't taught the Game Corner TM to yet, but we're gonna be grabbing that in a second. Maybe? I obviously could have used it here for better ranges, but come on, we do okay. Rival 6 falls, and while Thor completes Victory Road, let's take a look at where our racers stand. This is what I meant by interesting. It was really hard to track through the last little section because they have been all over the place. Boreas and Thor came out strong, not really having any major problems, while Vulcan suffered immensely early. But by the sixth badge, Vulcan is leading the pack by around two minutes. Thor gets stuck at Giovanni twice, while Vulcan doesn't exactly have an easy time either. It's Boreas' turn to take the lead finishing the gym challenge, being almost five minutes ahead when we enter the leagues. Given that Boreas ran first, we'll investigate their run first. We open against Lorelei.
Against Lorelei, we have a fairly easy time. Remember, Boreas is very bulky, and Lorelei's main threat is her water and ice moves, both of which we resist. I set up four calm mines, then going for bite, which is still only doing around half to Dugong. Good enough, though. Bite then chomps through her team. The first member falls. Let's check out Bruno. I think I was a touch headstrong leading into this Bruno battle. I thought that Stab Surf would just continue to carry us as it had in so many battles before. The problem is, though, that Bruno can actually be kinda threatening in the remakes. Less so in round one, sure, but as I see how little damage Surf is doing alone, I start backpedaling and trying to set up, but the battle falls apart for us. Trying again, I decided to set up against Hitmonchan right away. Onyx obviously just went away. I wanted to keep our speed intact if possible. Hitmonchan knows Rock Tomb as well, but we'll go for Sky Uppercut like he does both times here. I miss the KO, setting up a third Calm Mind, and then we've got the battle secured from there. Cool. That was a small misstep, but we're still cruising here. Let's check out Agatha. <laughs> Here we see the folly of trying to set up too hard against Agatha. My confidence wavered slightly after the encounter with Bruno, so I set up. I set up a lot. I set up way too much, as Gengar sets up her own double teams. What follows is a sad display of missing over and over while Gengar picks us apart. I'm addicted to you, don't you know that you're toxic? You. Anyway, with slightly better setup, this time only going to plus two in total, we can bring down her lead Gengar. I was hoping that plus two would be enough for the rest of the battle, which it is for the most part. Her ace Gengar survives, managing to poison us once more, but the power of plus two bites are just too much for Agatha to handle. Um, barely. We finish the battle with seven HP, but hey, once again, that's a win. Let's check out Lance. <laughs> I've discovered in the past against Round 1 Lance that you can get some good setup in against his lead Gyarados so long as you can take the hits. Our bulky Boreas sure can, setting up to plus 2 then striking down Gyarados with two Ice Beams. Ice Beam gets rid of his Dragonairs and boasts 4 times damage against Dragon Knight. A Surf for the speedy Aerodactyl in the back finishes the battle. What an easy breezy Elite 4, let's check out how the champ goes. Might I remind you quickly that we are quite underleveled here. In this battle, we're a full nine levels beneath his ace. Ice Beam isn't quite enough for Pidgeot, and the threat of Venusaur has definitely been diminished in his late game moveset. His grass move is now Solar Beam, taking either a turn to set up or a turn to set up the sun. This makes him a much more manageable foe, but his Gyarados is the one to absolutely pummel us into the ground. Ouch. I tried a couple of times, ending up dipping into our rare candies and using four, leveling up to 58 over two damage rounding thresholds. We're now able to one-shot Pidgeot, avoiding sand attacks, and at full health I actually hold all of the cards against Venusaur. I'm gonna start setting up Calm Minds, which increases both our special attack and special defense. Venusaur doesn't see the one-shot setting up growth. As I set up, he's gonna continue to not see the one-shot and try to set up himself, so I grab three turns of Calm Mind before nuking him. I then finish my setup all the way to plus six against Alakazam, and it's time to win the battle. All of this setup may seem excessive, but trust me, Gyarados is a wrecking ball. After such a dominant round one league, it's easy to see why I thought Suicune would be bringing home the win today. Boreas clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 11 minutes, and 48 seconds at level 59 with 15 resets. This took 3 hours and 59 minutes of game time. Vulcan starts with a disadvantage against Lorelei. She's the Ice-type trainer, so of course, most of her team is the Water-type. This is a problem for our poor Fire Doggo. Before the battle, I rounded out our moveset, teaching Sunny Day, which I lead the battle with, and Solar Beam. That alone lacks the power to win, but after some dancing around with two Calm Minds and more Sunny Day, we're at 25 health, but ready to rock. That little bit of health carries us through the rest of the battle, as plus two super effective single-turn Solar Beams make short work of her team. It's a very common thing for me to mention that I need to guard my speed in solo runs. It's just a fact of playing them. I risk taking a Rock Tomb from Onyx in order to set up the sunlight. Remember, this makes Solar Beam only take one turn and it powers up our flamethrowers. I use these two moves to start scorching through Bruno's team, but it's a little bit too much as Hitmonlee finishes the battle with Mega Kick. 
Vulcan is actually stuck here for a few minutes, once again dipping into my rare candies and using 6 to level to 60 over 3 damage rounding thresholds. It's another case where I feel like we only found success with a luckier battle. Both Machamp and Hitmonlee missed in key moments and this battle was super messy feeling still. We're victorious, but it never feels good dipping into rare candies this early. Agatha is on the other end of that spectrum though. With the extra levels that we needed for Bruno, she's an absolute joke. I set up the sun once more, then stab, sun boosted flamethrowers, charbroil her team of ghosts. Arbok manages to hit us. That's it. Well, battle over, but do you see the critical flaw in our moveset as we approach Lance? That's right, not a single effective move against any of Lance's team. Solar Beam is at least neutral to Gyarados and Aerodactyl, but Lance's dragons either resist or four times resist my attacking moves. I have an absolute slugfest against Gyarados trying to set up and not dealing enough damage, then trying to set up more. I end up at plus four in the sun with nine HP. Aerodactyl is next, and do you know the worst part? We have 169 speed. He has 173. Goodbye! After more resets, it was clear that we were just shy of what we needed, tying once more into our rare candies. This really doesn't feel great for round two. Even at this higher level, I'm still forced to set up to plus four against Gyarados, and I have a Citrus Berry equipped to give us that little bit of extra longevity. After the setup is complete, the fight is a wash, but I don't feel like that was possible without level 65. The setup process was just too dangerous. That just leaves the champion for Vulcan. Let's check it out. I'm afraid Vulcan's gonna have a little bit more trouble here as well. I start working my way through, okay, Pidgeot isn't a one-shot, uh, Rhydon loves lowering my speed, and Blastoise enjoys playing with the weather as well, outspeeding, setting up the rain, and hydro-pumping us away. Trying again, I set up the sun immediately, but still fall short on the damage required to take out Pidgeot. But we're about to see some weirdness. After missing the knockout a second time, I set up one Calm Mine, but the rival switches to Rhydon. The sun is out, so I can get rid of him immediately with Solar Beam. Blastoise is out, so heck, let's set up once more. I get in one more Calm Mind and then set the sun back up and take out the Shell Turtle. Outspeeding is key. With Blastoise and his biggest threat out of the way though, we're pretty set up and the rest of the battle ends up falling in quick succession. Okay, this wasn't nearly as smooth as Boreas, but come on. Surf and Ice Beam versus Flamethrower and Solar Beam? Ooh, but I wonder about Thunderbolt and Crunch. Vulcan clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 22 minutes, and 10 seconds at level 66 with 22 resets. This took 4 hours and 28 minutes of game time. Thor is still the only one of the trio that I haven't gone back to the game corner to pick up a TM for yet. But as this first battle against Lorelei is about to demonstrate, we don't really need it? Like the others, I set up two Calm Minds at the start of battle and, well, the battle is pretty much over from there. Bruno is going to be a little bit more challenging though. I actually get incredibly lucky in this first attempt. Against both of his Onyxes, I go for Bite, getting a flinch on the first turn both times, so neither can do anything. As it turns out though, luck isn't all that it takes sometimes. I start trying to set up a little bit against Hitmonchan, but it's all for naught, as our weaker defensive stat gets too beat up and we fall. Just like the others, it's time for Thor to dip into the rare candies a little bit. Thor uses 4, leveling up to 58 over 2 damage rounding thresholds. At this level, I can afford to lose a single stage of speed against his lead Onyx, taking him down. It's against the second Onyx that I go a little nuts. At 118 speed, we're still faster than his remaining Pokémon, but Hitmonchan knows Rock Tomb. So I set up Reflect and tank Earthquakes from Onyx while setting up. Insane? Maybe. But hey, it works! At 32 health and plus 3 from Calm Mind, it's bye-bye Bruno. That was another really cool one. Agatha is next. Alright, Agatha though? I am not worried here. It turns out that Bite, yes Bite, that move that we've had since the start of the game, is not quite enough to bring down her lead Gengar in a single shot. Um, but barely. So one Calm Mind later and it's time to win. Arbok is the only Pokémon on our team that we don't hit for super effective damage. Trust me though, Spark is still pretty darn effective. Thor secures another easy league victory. I'm again going to be leaning into the strategies that we've already explored with the others, set up and hope. 
I set up to plus three against Gyarados and go on the offense. I keep doing it in this run where I open my bag every time I move to use Bite. Apologies for any unwelcome screen flashing. Bite handles his Dragonairs with Spark missing the one shot against Dragonite. He fires back with a massive Hyper Beam, bringing us once again to one hit point. He's stuck recharging, and with our speed stat currently at 180, we outspeed Aerodactyl and finish the battle. boo ya! That leaves one more challenge in round one. I feel that in this battle again, it shows that Thor is right on the edge of his capabilities. Again, I haven't taught a single thing aside from Calm Mind to this Raikou. Spark almost takes out Pidgeot, so I set up one Calm Mind to make sure that the next one will. Rhydon is out, hitting a massive EQ, taking us down to that very familiar red bar. But we're fast and set up, so we cut a path through the champion's team one Pokémon at a time. His best last shot to defeat us was against Alakazam, but he flinched! Nah! Alright, so Boreas is obviously a force to be reckoned with, but Thor would not take no as an answer in this league. Thor clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 49 seconds at level 61 with 17 resets. This took 4 hours and 8 minutes of game time. We'll stick with Thor heading into the round two leagues. He'll be grabbing the final rare candy south of Snorlax on Route 12 that I always grab leftovers from, then finally going to Celadon to buy Thunderbolt and upgrade from Spark. I don't really have anything to report through the second portion of the Sevi Island plotline, so let's quickly see how we stand going into this final leg. Thor has lost their lead to Boreas, and can we really be surprised by that? Boreas had such a dominant time in the league compared to the other two. Vulcan has definitely continued to struggle the most though, sitting around 10.5 minutes behind the leader. In round 2, along with some team and moveset changes, all teams have been powered up by around 12 levels. As always, Lorelei is going to kick us off. <laughs> It feels like we have a completely new Thor as we start round two. Instead of Spark, we now have Thunderbolt. Instead of Bite, Crunch. Against Lorelei, I set up two Calm Minds, but that's all I'm going to risk. I remember Boreas's time with Agatha's Gengar. I take down Dugong, but Pyloswine is out next. Crunch does great damage, dropping Pylo to Red Bar, but he responds with a stab super effective Earthquake for around three quarters of our health. I set up a Calm Mind while she heals, then miss the one shot once more, getting taken out. This time I risked four turns of setup against Dugong, missing only once before connecting and bringing out Piloswine. Plus four crunch is enough this time, and it's no surprise that our fast, plus four, electric, legendary Thunder Pokémon carves through her remaining Cloyster and Lapras with Thunderbolt, switching again to Crunch for Jinx. I've been trying to be more aware of doing this. I default to the super effective move, but if I had gone for Thunderbolt, I could have skipped a whole text box. Hey, sometimes it's the little things that make big differences. Just ask my girlfriend. Let's check out Bruno. <laughs> Against Bruno, it's looking like we might be in trouble again, though. His Onyxes have been upgraded to Steelixes, and our best, well, only move that hits being Crunch, it's not doing that much damage. Add in that these things have Stab Earthquakes and a respectable 85 base attack, they hurt. I only get tagged by a single Rock Tomb after he misses another, but that's enough to drop us to 100 speed after leveling up. We got lucky against Steelix there, too. We barely can't one-shot Hitmonlee, setting up Reflect while he heals, then a Calm Mind while tanking another Earthquake. EQ's everywhere. We drop Hitmonlee, then miss the one-shot against Machamp as well, again barely getting taken out by Earth- Oh! Cross Chop! Nifty! After a couple more resets, I've dipped into my rare candies again, leveling up to 70. It hasn't really helped a huge amount, though, as I can quite easily lose to his lead Steelix still. Never mind the rest of the battle. I tried making it out of Steelix with my setup done at plus two, and in this attempt in good health. Reflect has just worn off, though, and my speed is trashed, so one hit from Hitmonlee and one hit from Machamp, and it's game over again. At level 73, it's still a struggle. Steelix can still knock us out by himself, but I feel like that's a reality that we're just gonna have to accept. Level 73 gives us one big advantage, though. We can now take two Rock Tombs and still outspeed the majority of his team. In this attempt, Steelix misses one Rock Tomb, hitting us with two more plus an Earthquake. I'm set up to only plus one, but I have a Reflect up, which as it turns was not necessary given we set it up after the Earthquake. 
Steelix falls, and at 111 speed, it's only Bruno's Hitmon Lee that outspeeds us now, with the next closest being Hitmon Chan at 110. I take out Lee and Machamp, but then right as Steelix 2 hits the field, the reflect drops. I decide to set up a new one, doubting the range that our health is currently at, and rightfully so. His Earthquake deals just over half of our remaining health, so the Reflect saved us there. Then I recover with Leftovers and pivot to Crunch. We do just barely half, tanking a second EQ and being brought to 7 hit points, healing back up to 21. That's right, Reflect plus Leftovers saved the end of this battle. We then outspeed, and our second crunch brings him down. With 111 speed, we're a tick faster than Hitmonchan, and with Reflect Up plus a little more healing from leftovers, we must be just outside of Mach Punch range. That concludes the battle. Thor has been living right on the edge this whole run. Agatha should be fun, though. <laughs> Oh, and fun she is! Crunch just barely doesn't knock out her lead Gengar because of course we outspeed, so while she heals I set up one Calm Mind. Thor then chomps and bolts through her team with a series of one-shots. Um, I really hate to cut the music short and start it over again so fast, but I'm out of things to say again. I love Crunch. Have I mentioned that I love Crunch? Crunch. Lance is next. <laughs> Against Lance, I have a bit of tricksy shenanigans up my sleeve. This Gyarados lives to paralyze you, so I take him out of the picture immediately with a stab 4 times super effective Thunderbolt. Aerodactyl is out next, and I'm actually going to be setting up here. I reflect, taking the first EQ for about a quarter. I can live with that, especially as Leftovers ticks for an extra 14 health. I set up two Calm Minds and then go for the knockout, with more Thunderbolt taking care of his lesser Dragonite. Kingdra is out, Thunderbolt. Against his Ace Dragonite, there's another case of leaving him at a sliver. Much to my surprise, he doesn't heal while I set up another Calm Mind, but at plus three special defense, Outrage isn't really doing much to us. Bam! No more Lance. Thor's final challenge lies in the Round 2 Champion. I'm going to be talking about my need to guard my speed again in this fight. Our first attempt is one of the best ones, mostly because we were able to paralyze and then fully paralyze Heracross on the first turn. He was likely going for Earthquake or Rock Tomb, Rock Tomb which would be worse. I can then blast through his first three Pokemon, but after a single EQ from Tyranitar we're pretty banged up. <laughs> we miss the range, barely, again against Alakazam while he responds with a Stab Psychic ending the battle. Rats. Let's check it out after a few attempts, with the Heracross encounter being more average. He does tag us with a Rock Tomb, but that's all he manages to do. Thunderbolt is still zapping through his team, but we're taking more EQs along the way. Yeah, even from Charizard. In hindsight, I might have been able to reflect here and set up more, because missing the one-shot against Tyranitar is fatal. If Heracross does anything more than a single Rock Tomb, then we're in even more trouble, because Gyarados would just outspeed and end us with his own EQ. This is the point that with a heavy heart, I decided it was time to cheat. But only a little, tiny, tiny little cheat. With a couple of extra rare candies, I've used four to bring us up to 78 over one more damage rounding threshold. I've been playing around with a little, and I've determined that Heracross Baloney is inevitable, setting up one Calm Mind and hoping for the best. Which we get here as he misses Rock Tomb. It's only 80% accurate after all. At plus one, with our speed intact, there's no worries until we meet the big bad T-Tar. I get really stubborn here, refusing to set up another Calm Mind while he's in a healing loop, but I was so scared of taking another EQ and losing this attempt. He finally falls, and it seems that I made all of the right calls as we outspeed and finish off Alakazam and Executor with plus one super effective crunches. Phew, talk about another close one. I feel like that whole time we were one move away from Annihilation pretty much at all times. Thor clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 44 minutes, and 45 seconds at level 78 with 36 resets. This took 5 hours and 18 minutes of game time. Jumping back once again with Boreas, now let's see if the dominance of the Round 1 League continues in Round 2. All three beasts, and pretty much every run I've done, picks up the leftovers for Round 2. They restore 1 16th of your max health every turn, and that's going to help the bulky Boreas the most. Just check out the start of this battle. Our best move after all of this time remains Bite against Lorelei. We have a rough go against Dugong, setting up to plus 6, but still not being able to bring her down in a single shot. 
The evasiveness hurts too, but we eventually connect at only 72 health remaining though. Alright, let's hope that that set us up for success. Lapras is next and we're doing over half again, and Thunder paralyzes us. We're just barely clinging on though, working through her team until Piloswine, ignoring our special defense setup, outspeeds our paralyzed beast, ending the battle with Stab Earthquake. With Dugong being less punishing and Lapras not paralyzing us though, we see a successful battle. Stab's super effective Surf washes away Piloswine before he even gets a chance. Jinx is then an easy cleanup and that's Lorelei down. A hiccup, but let's see what the rest of the league holds. I do not want to lose speed again, so I take out Bruno's Steelix immediately with Surf. Hitmonlee comes out next. Perfect. I set up one Calm Mind while he misses, but seriously. We can tank hits from Hitmonlee for quite a while, and he doesn't have Rock Tomb baloney. At only plus one though, I switch back to the offense, and Stab Surf does a little wet work if you know what I mean. I don't one-shot Machamp at plus one, but honestly his Stab Cross Chop didn't impress me. That's a quick and easy Bruno, Agatha is next. I didn't mention it at Lorelei because I didn't end up using it, but I've taught Rest to Boreas over Bite. Let's see though, Super Effective Bite has an effective power of 120, while Stab Neutral Surf has an effective power of 142. I've taken off leftovers in favor of a Lumberry, which saves us from confusion as I set up to plus two against Gengar. Plus two Stab Surf does the job again. Well, almost. We missed the one shot, heh. <laughs> Barely against Arbok, so why not set up to plus three while she heals? We end up poisoned again and a little bit battered by the end of the fight, but it's another first try victory for Boreas. But that streak ends at Lance. You'd think, well, hey, Ice Beam is greater than Lance, right? Well, yes, but that's not the whole story here. I put the leftovers back on to supplement our health, and with Rest in our corner, I don't see the need to fear Thunder Wave as much. I try setting up to plus two against Gyarados, but after some setup of his own with Dragon Dance, we're paralyzed and at three health as he goes down. Ice Beam is greater than this Dragonite, unless he goes first. Gyarados continues to be quite threatening and is more than capable of simply ending us in a relatively quick fashion. But I can be a little bit stubborn sometimes and I was convinced that there was something here that I was missing. Let's not talk about the nine rare candies that are sitting in my bag though. I tried playing with cherry berries, but decided to stick with leftovers. I eat the paralysis, setting up only one Calm Mind, then taking out his lead with two Ice Beams. He brings out his Ace Dragonite next for Thunderbolts, but at plus one with our impressive defensive stats, they actually don't hurt that much. I rest, restoring our health and speed, then plus one Ice Beam easily takes out both Dragonites. I then set up to plus five with four more Calm Minds against Kingdra, misclicking, but even the quad resisted Surf does impressive damage. The path to the finish is easy after that. We don't outspeed Aerodactyl, but that's fine. Awesome, champion time. We don't exactly have an auspicious start here, but we are only level 66 against his level 72 lead. Surf does maybe a third while our speed gets dropped and I set up one Calm Mind. It doesn't really get better though as the champion's physical onslaught continues shaking the ground from beneath this first attempt. For the sake of brevity, I'm gonna skip us ahead to the successful attempt. Nine resets and five and a half minutes later, this is what I've learned. I've tied into those rare candies, now at level 73 over three damage rounding thresholds. We're a legendary remember, so this also buffs our stats overall quite significantly. I really need to understand the switch logic more in these battles, and I've accepted that a Rock Tomb from Heracross is inevitable as I set up one Calm Mind. This isn't enough for a one-shot, but when I go for the follow-up, he switches in Venusaur. I know that I have a small window of opportunity here, so I set up another Calm Mind as Venusaur uses Sludge Bomb, of course poisoning us. Okay, well, let's risk it, and I go for Rest Recovering. We're in the sun, getting blasted by Stab Super Effective Solar Beams, but our own setup is preventing a ton of damage. I snag one more turn, and now at plus three, pivot to Ice Beam for the knockout. Okay, we're doing okay now? This was a shaky one, but I think we've gained control. We get a lucky miss from Heracross with Megahorn, which I think would have been the end. I recover and set up further against Alakazam as I'm not very threatened by him at all at the moment. I set up to plus six, trying to go to plus seven because I was going a little bit cross-eyed at the time, but healing a second time, we're now in full control for the rest of the battle. The reason I did this was once again for the super menacing Gyarados in the back. If I'd given him the opportunity, he would have set up and ruined us with Earthquakes. A plus six critical Ice Beam handles him though, and Arcanine falls to a stab, super effective Surf. 
Wowza, there was a lot to unpack in that one. But with both beasts that we've seen so far, I'd say that my path through the second playthrough is becoming quite apparent. Boreas clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 37 minutes, and 46 seconds at level 73 with 28 resets. This took 5 hours and 5 minutes of game time. I've saved Vulcan for last because editing me knows what we're about to witness. I'm not proud of my play in this upcoming league and I feel like I did Vulcan a bit of a disservice. With that being said though, that fire typing and our only coverage pretty much being contingent on sunny day makes for a rough combo. You'd think that we'd start seeing the effects of that bad type matchup against Lorelei, but honestly not really. I set up the sunlight first, cutting the power of incoming surfs. Then I set up to plus two and nuke Dugong with solar beam. I have to set the sun back up against Cloyster, but solar beams and flamethrowers for Piloswine and Jinx dominate her team. I must be going crazy, I remember this league breaking me a little bit. I'm facing the perpetual speed problem against Bruno once more, and I want to melt away both of those Steelixes right away with stab super effective flamethrowers. I set up the sun against Hitmonchan, which isn't quite enough for the one shot. He heals while I set up one Calm Mind, and this battle belongs to us. I'm happy that Hitmonchan didn't go for Rock Tomb, but looking at our current speed, we could have lost a single stage here without an issue. Easy again. Maybe it was Agatha? There are definitely some victories and some defeats in this encounter against our lead Gengar. Going with the theme of these beasts, I miss the knockout by a sliver in the sun, so I switch to setting up two Calm Minds instead. The problem is that we're going to be put to sleep, and by the time we bring down her lead, we're at only 41 health. Hopefully that setup is enough, and uh, yeah, wowza. Plus two stabbed flamethrowers serve up the rest of Agatha's team extra crispy. Okay, hmm, maybe this wasn't as bad as I remember. I could have sworn I flew off the handle at one point in this league. It's then that I remember that pesky lance battle where we have zero coverage. Well, we know the paralysis problem, let's see how much our solar beam does on its own. Huh, not exactly an inspiring amount of damage. Oh, and we're out of hit points already. Five resets later and I've used our last two rare candies bringing us up to level 73 over the next damage rounding threshold. How much did this help? Not at all. I mean, you haven't seen Dragonite yet, but trust me, this is among the best attempts so far. This is when I really let my frustration and my emotional state get away from me. Oh hi! You're joining us 13 resets and 8 minutes later where I've incrementally used my cheaty rare candies to go all the way up to level 100. How much did it help? Eh, I mean, we could make it deeper into the battle now. While playing, it was my boorish attitude at this point that kept me locked into the same strategy, simply blasting rare candies into my Pokémon and not thinking. I was so single-tracked into simply wanting substitute, but are you seeing something obvious that we also used on a run that I played before this one? Yeah, rest sure would have helped with that paralysis problem that we're continuing to have. Surely at level 100 we have the bulk, but I was blinded by my own bad attitude. After more wipes at level 100, I paused the timer and shut down the game. After taking a minute to compose myself, I came back in and cheated a little bit more. This time though, I reverted our levels back to 73 where we were before we started cheating. I've made a different change though, adding HP Ice to our set. That's the default against Lance, and it sure helps, but back down at level 73, the hits we're taking are just too heavy. I started incrementing my levels up to 85, continuing to try to find strategies with hidden power now. It continues to not really lead us anywhere productive. I was so upset and I didn't try rest strats at all. So I'm not proud about how I played this, but in these videos I feel it's really important to show my entire experience playing with these Pokémon. The good, the bad, and the ugly. After more resets, I decided to cheat again, changing strategies one final time. I revert once again to level 73, but this time I have HP Ice and Substitute in my arsenal. Substitute sacrifices a quarter of your max HP to put up a decoy with health equivalent to what you sacrificed. It then absorbs damage, but more importantly, status conditions from the opponent. It kind of breaks the AI, and Gyarados will just sit there trying to paralyze our puppet endlessly. I can use the opportunity to set up all of the Calm Minds that I need. I choose three. Then HP Ice shreds through his team, with only the super speedy Aerodactyl getting in a shot and breaking our decoy. We're five speed points below him, by the way. And there goes the battle. Okay, let's stick with this set and see what the champion has in store for us. Well, honestly, things don't go much better here. 
It's our weakness to ground type moves and the absolutely absurd number of earthquakes that exist in the round two league. I try setting up to plus two against Heracross behind a decoy guarding our speed from rock tombs. It works with Flamethrower taking him down, but Tyranitar quickly shuts us down with more earthquakes. We've spent a lot of time in these first playthroughs because there was just so much to talk about. I'm skipping us ahead again, six resets and about four minutes of learning the battle. I've tied back into those illegal rare candies, leveling up to 78. I would really like to get to plus six, but we have to have a semi-cooperative Heracross. Once our HP drops below a certain point, he seems to only want to spam EQ, so we have to take him out at plus five. Plus five flamethrowers though pack a wallop, and it's enough to deal with the majority of the champion's remaining team. Nothing is guaranteed, as even Arcanine in the back can do some fairly impactful damage with extreme speeds as we bring him down as well. Wow man, what a league. So this is another interjection from editing me. I captured this run almost five days ago now. I've been mulling over what my second playthrough is going to look like the whole time. Last night, I think I had a Eureka moment. Oh man, let me know in the comments what you would do with this one. Vulcan clocks in with a round 2 time of 2 hours, 1 minute, and 23 seconds at level 78 with 56 resets and a whole bunch of cheating. This took 5 hours and 40 minutes of game time. Alright, this video is already quite long, so I'm going to be blasting through these second playthroughs, only discussing the changes that I made and the points that I found interesting. While Suicune is setting up, let's check out the final times from the first runs. Our winner is... Boreas. Honestly, not surprising. Thor is a monster, but the electric type requires a little bit more finesse than the water type in Fire Red. Boreas was also the only one that didn't resort to cheating and had the lowest level, although Thor only needed a little boost at the very end there. Not like poor Vulcan. That was a rough one right from the start. Here's hoping that the changes I planned will make the difference in these second playthroughs. Let's jump in. I'm gonna be skipping the Brock section with the other two. As it turns out, defeating Camper Liam was the best choice for all three, so covering one covers them all. In Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Helix Fossil. Blue little house with a blue little window and a blue Corvette. I did also make a mistake with Suicune's early game experience. I cleared an additional trainer in Mount Moon and the trainers in Misty's gym with the goal of being level 18 before attempting Rival 2. Misty is as straightforward as last game, but at the end of the battle, I'm just shy of level 18. Don't! Okay, yuck. I'll go to the grass and defeat a couple of wild Pokemon to level up. Suicune's route remains largely unchanged, just with a few optimizations. Being level 18 in this battle gives us a slightly easier time, but even so, when Bulbasaur decides it's time for sleep and Leech Seed, there isn't really a whole lot that I can do to prepare for it. With a slightly better interaction between Bulbasaur and Pidgeotto, we find a successful attempt in the next battle. The rival felt like Suicune's biggest problem throughout the last playthrough, a trend that continued on the SSN. Another thing that all three runs will be doing is grabbing an army of Meowths to farm some pickups. That's right, as weird as it feels supplementing a Legendary's coverage with Hidden Power, all three will be going for it. As such, I've had a lot more berries at my disposal throughout the run, and I'm not shy about using Chestos in the rival battles for Suicune. Anything to give me an edge over Sleep Powder. The following section doesn't differ at all from last run, so let's make some fast progress. I defeat Lieutenant Surge while still at full health, complete all of my mid-game chores like grabbing the tea, and then clear the rocket hideout. Exactly like last run, even with an identical triple water threat moveset. Our path turns east, skipping Erika again and continuing the rocket plotline. We are dealing some massive hits in this battle against Rival 4, but as we saw last playthrough, the threat of his Ivysaur must be considered. I have a Chesto Berry equipped again, this time with it saving us from Sleep Powder after knocking Ivysaur down to Red Bar. Our coverage isn't fantastic yet, but Water and Dark are plenty enough for the time being. We're then in Sylphco collecting items. I felt that collecting items in here was necessary again for all three runs, as all three need vitamins and a TM from the game corner. That's the only goal in Sylph for now though, as I finish my collection and then head back to Celadon. I buy my vitamins, maxing our special attack and speed with Suicune before turning south towards Fuchsia City. Similarly to last run again, Suicune is going to be pursuing Blaine's badge early. After collecting Surf, I face Koga and end up taking another reset. Muck poisons us two turns in a row with Sludge, the first activating our berry, but then the damage ends up overwhelming us. 
On the next attempt, I defeat Koga, and then across the sea, Blaine falls in short order. We're gonna go help Bill in the Sevi Islands next, then backtrack to Celadon. The plan is that including defeating all of the trainers in Blaine's gym, again, all three beasts will be doing this, I'm hoping to have enough cash for Ice Beam on our return trip to Celadon. Back in Cinnabar, after selling several non-essential items to the Mart, I have just barely enough money to go back to Celadon and buy TM-13. We have learned Aurora Beam at this point, but come on, Ice Beam is so much better, and getting it earlier is super nice. Okay, we're ready to move on with some more plot. I freeze-dry Erika with my shiny new move, and then against Rival 5 and Sylph, Ice Beam's power really reveals itself. We one-shot Pidgeot and bring Venusaur into Red Bar, oh yeah. I'm still rocking a Chestoberry, by the way, for these rival battles, which saves us again against Venusaur, putting us to sleep, and we wake up instantly. Ha! That Venusaur being the biggest threat and out of the way, the rest of the battle is no problem at all. I can then defeat Sabrina, gaining access to Calm Mind, and Giovanni completing the gym challenge in 52 minutes. It was just like last run, stab, surf, ahoy. Our final challenge before the league is rival 6, but with Ice Beam and Calm Mind on our side, I feel like we're in a pretty good position. Or so I thought. We just barely missed the one shot against Pidgeot, and so I kind of end up on my back foot early, even though really nothing changes. Things get extra messy against Venusaur as I try to sneak in some setup, and I bring him down with only 23 HP remaining. Oh boy, I continue progressing when Gyarados survives and goes for Hydro Pump, connecting, but we hold on again with 5 health. Oof, that one was a close one. Suicune has no further preparations to make before the league, so let's hop back and check out the changes made to the other two. I'll continue with Raikou, because I feel like it's obvious that Entei is going to need the most work. Again, I'm skipping Brock because we watched Suicune do the exact same thing. In Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Dome Fossil. Raikou is the only beast not doing any additional battles in the cave, instead defeating one trainer in Misty's gym to level us to 15 before taking her on. I have to be honest here though, the start of this run felt almost cursed for Raikou. We miss the one shot against Staryu, but don't take an extra hit at least, but then against Star Me, we roll bad damage ranges, missing the two shot, and she crits with Water Pulse. So, um, we lose? That actually happens twice before I'm able to hit some proper ranges and not get crit. Okay, finally, but then Rival 2 is no better. Remember how Raikou had the easiest time of the three against the rival? In this attempt, I take multiple critical hits, and when Charmander tags us with his final Ember, he gets a burn. Abra would have been free, but our seven remaining HP and the victory is robbed from us by burn damage. Who would have thunk it? When the rival doesn't act like a total butt, Raikou goes back to the dominant trend of the first playthrough. Goodness. All right, let's get some stuff done. I defeat rival three after grabbing my Meowth army, then Lieutenant Surge for three badges, but I'm not done complaining about the cursed nature of this early game. On my way to Rock Tunnel, I have to face Bugcatcher Connor. He's completely forgettable in most runs. I'm absentmindedly zapping through his Caterpie and Weedle, but then Venonat comes out. Venonat has been a pain before, but never like this. I almost one-shot it with Thundershock, with him responding with a pathetic confusion that also confuses me. Then, as Raikou proceeds to hit itself in confusion four times in a row, Venonat lands Poison Powder, making those lost turns even more impactful. Raikou, the legendary Thunder Beast, falls to Bugcatcher Connor's Venonat from pretty much full health. No wonder Scott loves this line. Thankfully, I've been caught out by Picnicker Alicia in the past, so I did save in front of her. I was honestly so close to completely scrapping this run and trying again. We were only 20 minutes in after all when this happened, but I didn't feel like that would be a fair thing to do for the other two. Sometimes you can just train for months, but on the day of the race, things just don't go well. It happens. But that karmic balance is about to shift back in our favor as Raikou's luck turns 180 degrees as a reward for my patience. In Celadon, I'm making an early stop at the department store to visit the roof and grab TM33 Reflect in exchange for Lemonade. Then, after collecting Fly, I quickly grab all of the items that my Meowths have been finding. Among them, TM10. Well, after the absolute travesty that this run has been so far, you bet your booties I'm gonna teach this right away. For Raikou, I've chosen HP Water, and as I teach Pidgey Fly, I almost completely rework Raikou's moveset from Thundershock, Bite, Leer, and Roar to a fantastic Shockwave, Bite, HP Water, and Reflect. Honestly, HP Water doesn't make a massive impact at this point in the game, but it'll make a few spots easier. With Reflect on our side this time, Giovanni's Kanga hurts significantly less, only tapping us once and then switching to Tail Whips for the rest of the battle while I take him out. Cool! 
It's time for Raikou to make some fast progress. I defeat Rival 4 at full health, heh <laughs> Then mirroring Suicune's route, I collect items in Sylph and start my journey south. For Vitamins, I maxed out our special attack, then defense, just like last playthrough. Rival 5 wasn't an issue, but Giovanni was, so I'm skipping them both for the time being. Don't worry though, we'll be back there before you know it. There are some consequences of not grabbing Lapras early, like having to skip by the rare candy in the Warden's house. At least it's easy enough to backtrack for. I then defeat Koga, and we're back in Sylph challenging Rival 5. At level 39, we one-shot his entire team, except Alakazam and Charizard, neither of which really pose much of a threat to us while we're still at nearly full health. Let's see how that Giovanni battle goes, though. Honestly, it's not that bad. Using HP Water instead of Bite helps us avoid some Poison Point, and moves the battle along a little bit faster. The real winner here, though, is Reflect. Really wish that I'd figured out that one earlier in the last run. Taking away their ability to bully my defensive stat made all of the difference. With that little sticking point out of the way, let's keep progressing. I defeat Sabrina, teaching Calm Mind shortly after, which then in combination with HP Water defeats Blaine. Honestly, again, early HP Water wasn't game-changing, but it did help along the way. Taking a page from Suicune's book after helping Bill in the Sevi Islands, we're now ready to pick up our Game Corner TM. Having Thunderbolt before round two is definitely nice, check this out. Even resisted, it one-shots Erica's team. Granted, my Cherry Berry did allow one turn of Calm Mind against Victory Bell. That leaves one final badge for Raikou, but it was the trickiest one for us to get. This is the first time that having HP Water is truly impactful. Losing speed from Rhyhorn's scary face isn't something that I can afford, and HP Water allows me to take him out immediately. I can then set up a single Calm Mind while Dugtrio smacks us after setting up Reflect. Oh, uh, he crit, can't help that. When he doesn't crit, then super effective HP Water can carve a channel through Giovanni's team, wrapping up the gym challenge in 56 minutes, four behind Suicune. I then missed a turn of setup against Rival 6, missing the one-shot against Execute, and getting paralyzed. Alakazam says, no way guy, and shuts us down again. With just a single Calm Mind though, Raikou responds with, ya na mate, one-shotting his entire team. That wraps up Raikou's changes, let's check out today's problem child, Entei. We beat up Brock, same as the others, then collect the dome fossil on the way through Mount Moon. Rise, my domies, rise! Entei has done a little bit of additional training in the cave, clearing three additional trainers. This allows us that little bit of extra oomph when facing Rival 2, and with him quickly out of the way, it's time to start thinking about the biggest problem of the early game, Misty. On Camper Flint for TM43 Secret Power again. You may have noticed that I chose a modest nature this time, reducing our attack in favor of special attack. 115 base special attack minus 10% is still sizable, so grabbing secret power remains a good call. Concerning Misty though, I tried finding ways to not backtrack, but this one just kind of solved itself. In the last run, I said something during the Misty battle. We seem to be doing around half to each other, but Starmie is faster, so Starmie wins. Well, Starmie has 53 speed. Upgrading our Entei from 15 to near-perfect IVs grants us 54 speed at level 21. So once Staryu is out of the way, we move first and our two bites bring down Starmie. Well, that was easy. After grabbing our Meowths on the way south to the SSN, I have to ask all of you. You're aware of what hidden power typing I went with for Raikou, but what about Suicune and Entei? Suicune was a reasonably obvious one I felt, but Entei? As I mentioned, I spent days mulling this over in my head. Let me know in the comments what typings you would have gone with and why. I love getting a broader aggregate of reasoning and ideas. Entei is motoring right now though, so let's keep making progress. We're at a much lower level than last run against Surge, but even so, leaning into our physical side a little is great here. Raichu doesn't have great defense, so even with our minus attack nature, our secret power is a two-shot. Wicked. For comparison, Entei just beat Surge faster than everybody else in these second playthroughs, six seconds ahead of Suicune and 44 ahead of Raikou's cursed early game. Oh yeah, we have a race here. Obviously, Entei's route is slightly different with the earlier defeat of Misty. Not that much though, as we can just fly earlier and won't need to worry about backtracking. Entei's mid-game plan mirrors the others with a goal of getting access to Flamethrower as early as possible. As such, the only vitamins I'll be focusing on feeding Entei are Calcium for special attack. As it turns out, I may have wanted some defense as well, more on that later. With Entei 2, I'm grabbing the PP ups as I encounter them, but this is mostly for cash. I then defeat Erika, and Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower. 
leading us to Sylph once more to focus on bankrolling my plans. With the exception of the Misty routing and focusing more on getting Flamethrower, nothing super impactful changes for Entei through the mid-game. Down in the Safari Zone, because I didn't show it last time, I'm grabbing TM11 Sunny Day. This is another move that will be making an earlier appearance on our moveset. After collecting a couple more high-value items in the Safari Zone, like Steel Wing, the Protein, Double Team, I can sell them and find myself at 81,000 Poké Dollars, so let's buy Flamethrower. Just like last run, it's our best stab move, and Sunny Day is going to supplement our damage until we can get access to Calm Mind. Another note is that Entei has once again grabbed Return, and that has been a great tool through the mid-game, even with the minus attack nature. Our late game relies entirely on special attack though, but we're getting there. Entei takes the first reset of the run against Koga's Muck. It's not for lack of strategy, it's more my overall abysmal luck with poison. One Pecha Berry just isn't enough sometimes, and Muck's minimizes prevent us from getting anything done in an effective way. When his ace wheezing hits the field, we've officially had too much. This actually happens to us twice, but check out the power of sun-boosted stab flamethrowers when they actually hit. We almost one-shot wheezing, which I hadn't really planned on to be honest. I was convinced that this was a two-shot, and as the sun fades and our normal flamethrowers seem to do three quarters, maybe I could have optimized this slightly better. Either way, let's keep progressing. The Sun gives us more benefits than just boosting our damage as well. Against Rival 5 and Sylph, in the sunlight we one-shot Pidgeot, but it was his Blastoise that really gave us trouble last run. I have my Citrus Berry equipped again, but in the sunshine, his Water Guns do half as much damage, so he seems more intent to protect and stall out my weather. I'm just going for returns here, and 3 is enough to knock him out. Then, well, the rest of the battle is quite easy after that. I then defeat Sabrina, followed by Blaine, after dealing with the Sevi Islands, it's Entei's turn to learn Hidden Power. I ended up going with HP Grass. Yep, slightly weaker, but single turn Solar Beam. I spent a long time thinking about this. For the longest time, my top contender was HP Dragon, but after doing some testing and math, Grass ended up feeling like the best choice. I tested using Electric, Water, Grass, and Psychic in the leagues. Similarly to Raikou, I can use Hidden Power to eliminate Rhyhorn early to keep our speed intact. Then, one turn of setup against Dugtrio, and stab flamethrowers win. We finished the gym challenge just shy of 56 minutes, putting Entei 11 seconds ahead of Raikou and 4 minutes behind Suicune. Entei having the roughest time in the first playthrough means that Entei is going to inspire the most cheese from me in the second playthroughs where my goal is to beat the game as quickly as possible using every tool at my disposal. In that tool set lies, oh yeah, substitute. Substrats, best strats. This moveset represents how Entei will be clearing the remainder of the game. I take my first shot with it against Rival 6, dropping a decoy and setting up a single Calm Mind from safety. I avoid a Feather Dance, which, you know, whatever, but Pidgeot seems more intent on dealing damage, breaking our decoy. I got what I needed though, and we can roll through Rival 6 without any issues. With that, all three of our racers are ready to take on the leagues, where everything will be decided. For the sake of time, I'm going to be supercutting these Round 1 leagues. We're going to see more impactful versions of the same battles in Round 2, where I'll also discuss any minor points that may have affected Round 1. Before starting the league, I dumped 10, yes, 10 rare candies into Entei to maximize our chance of success. I know Entei struggled a lot here, but trust me, you will see similar strategic choices in Round 2 in every battle. With the Big Bad Lance defeated, let's check out our first Round 1 champion. Against his lead Pidgeot, I don't want to lose any accuracy, so I lead with Substitute right away. I can then set up from relative safety, getting in my two Calm Minds while Bird Brains breaks the decoy twice. That's fine though, again, we got what we needed. We have an answer to every member of his team until we hit Arcanine, but honestly, even our resisted flamethrowers at plus two are more than ample to defeat this guy. He does sneak in an egg stream speed, but we had plenty of buffer. Wowza, just like that, round one is gone. Oh man, Substrat's best strats. It's not a cure-all, we do know this, but when utilized effectively, there are few things better for a solo runner. Entei clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 3 minutes, and 53 seconds at level 63 with 4 resets. This took 3 hours and 57 minutes of game time. 
Raikou, I'll handle the same, skipping over round one and only presenting the champion battle. Raikou as well used a few rare candies before starting the league, but only three, starting the league at level 53 instead of Entei's 60. It pains me to admit, but I'll be skipping crunch in this run, as HP Water covers most of what we needed the Dark Dype move for, but better. That's it for Raikou. They were a simple solve in this league. Let's check out that champion. This champ battle goes to show how planning is everything. Thunderbolt takes out Pidgeot, no questions, and then HP Water handles Rhydon. Alakazam is primarily a special attacker, so I set up two turns of Calm Minds against him, feeling like this was the safest spot. I can then take him out with plus two stab Thunderbolt, but Executor I don't have a great answer for. Thunderbolt is a two-shot, but this is why I have a Chesto Berry. He loves putting you to sleep, and I'm having none of that. His Gyarados and Charizard then fall to more supercharged bolts, and we have a victory. This was another super fast league, and both Entei and Raikou cleared it in a similar amount of time. Suicune was the leader going in though, we'll check them out after... Raikou clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 3 minutes, and 55 seconds at level 57 with 6 resets. This took 3 hours and 51 minutes of game time. Suicune doesn't need any help in the first part of the league. I jumped right into the round one battles, but after defeating Lance, I dip into our rare candies using five of them to bring us to level 58. So our rare candy usage is as follows. Suicune has used five, Raikou three, and Entei ten. Suicune also having the best natural coverage, at least in Fire Red, hasn't needed to learn hidden power yet. Any guesses on what I went with? Suicune is prepped, let's beat up the champion. We cannot one-shot Pidgeot, so setting up a Calm Mind and hoping for his cooperation is the only way. We take a Sand Attack here, unfortunate, but Bird Brains falls after a miss. I then have a little bit of leeway against Venusaur, setting up one additional Calm Mind before missing and bringing down him as well. I'm done setting up with Bite for Alakazam, Surf for Rhydon, and then switching back to Ice Beam for Gyarados. He responds with Dragon Rage and then a Thrash after I miss again, but we're still going okay. I then miss again against Arcanine, taking an extreme speed, but then connect, ending the battle. I think that battle really demonstrated the security that we held there. Four misses after one sand attack, but we still got through the battle, albeit in red bar. Suicune clocks in with a round one time of one hour, two minutes, and 32 seconds at level 59 with four resets. This took three hours and 49 minutes of game time. Okay everyone, I am so pumped to reveal what we're looking at in this final leg of the race. Everyone does the exact same thing through the Sevi Islands, collecting leftovers, and then with Entei and Raikou, I dip back to the Warden's house in Fuchsia to grab that extra rare candy. But Suicune comes back to Fuchsia too. Everybody wants Substitute in round two. But let's check out how our racers stand. Suicune is still leading, but dropped from being four minutes ahead to only one minute and 21 seconds ahead of Entei. The crazier bit? Entei and Raikou are separated by two seconds seconds at the end of round one. Here we go everyone, it's time for the round two leagues. Let me know who you think is gonna win. I already know the answer and I am still all pumped up right now. Let's jump in. Suicune is the current leader, so let's check out their league first. Between the leagues I taught Substitute and with a tear rolling down my cheek, deleted Ice Beam in favor of HP Electric. Gosh, you know, I just hate getting rid of Ice Beam, but hey, this works better. I set up to plus four against Lorelei's Dugong, putting the rest of her team in range of one-shots. Bruno is next. He ends up being a little bit of a pain, honestly. In hindsight, I should have just used Substitute to set up against Steelix, but I didn't want to just do that in every battle. So I take out Steelix and then set up against Hitmonlee instead, tanking a few Mega Kicks. My goal is to get to plus three, which I accomplish right as Hitmonlee crits and takes us out. If he misses the third kick, instead of getting a critical with it, we see a successful battle. Plus three may seem excessive, but after taking a bit of a beating from Hitmonlee, I wanted to make sure that Machamp would always be a one-shot. We are five levels beneath him at this point, after all. Suicune is dominating so far, but remember, it's taking us a few turns to set up every battle. It's effective, but not necessarily the fastest. In round one, for instance, we could rely more on simply dealing damage. Bruno falls, facing Agatha next. Thank you. 
Between battles, I pop on a Lumberry because at 170 speed, we're just below her lead Gengar at 173. She ends up missing Hypnosis anyway, but hey, I prefer keeping in line with these safer and more consistent strategies, well, most of the time anyway. Once we're behind our decoy, her Gengar becomes far less threatening, setting up to plus three and rolling through her team. The plus three was actually for Arbok to guarantee the one shot. Saving a turn here and there can be impactful. Sweet. Well, with Substitute, I'm sure you all know how easy round two Lance is gonna be. I pop the leftovers back on, then because we outspeed, I can drop a decoy, and then just sit here setting up with impunity while Gyarados tries in vain to paralyze our decoy. This is the strategy that I chose to use here because honestly, without Ice Beam on our team, Suicune struggled a lot more with Lance. That is, without Substitute. Being able to set up to plus 5 pretty much for free sure helps our chances. It's funny, neutral HP Electric deals about the same amount of damage as our stab-resisted Surfs. That interaction is part of what makes choosing hidden power types so rough sometimes. Lance gets washed away and Suicune is ready for one final challenge, the Round 2 Champion. Before starting the battle, I used the last of Suicune's rare candies, seven in total, bringing us to level 73. The champion is kind of a giant wild card for all three, and a lot of that comes down to what mood Heracross is in. My goal is to set up as many Calm Minds as I can against him, then essentially feel my way through the rest of the battle. Here, Heracross is dead set on hitting a bunch of Mega Horns, and when he's feeling horny, there isn't a thing I can do but put up more decoys and hope he goes away. This puts us on our back foot early, and despite my best efforts, we lose the attempt only because I make the mistake of using Surf instead of HP Electric against Gyarados. Arrgh. In the next attempt, though, Heracross behaves much better, allowing us to set up to plus four while still in green health. I feel like I've tested my luck here enough, taking him down with Surf and then Tyranitar as well. I feel like mentally I was slightly stuck in my previous strategy here, needing to worry about Gyarados, so against Venusaur I set up to plus six and try getting up another decoy. In hindsight, this step wasn't necessary as we bring down his ace and the rest of his team with a series of one-shots. Arcanine did sneak in an extreme speed again, but we're well above the threshold for safety for that one. Alright, so despite a reset because of my own misplay, that was an incredibly solid league. But remember, Suicune is the bulkiest and least offensive of the trio. Will the others do better? Suicune clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 20 minutes, and 31 seconds at level 73 with 6 resets. This took 4 hours and 50 minutes of game time. We'll explore Raikou next because they had a reasonable time last run and only needed to cheat in 4 rare candies at the very end to make it through. Our updated strategy though should do the trick. Before starting the battle, it's Raikou's turn for an insulin spike, eating 9 rare candies and leveling up to 70. I've also taught Substitute to Raikou, replacing Reflect. Unlike Suicune, who needed 4 turns of setup in this battle, Raikou only needs 1 to carve through Lorelei with a series of one-shots. HP Water is definitely a nice addition for Piloswine as well. Bruno, though... Well, in round one, I followed the same strategy as the first playthrough, taking out Onyx and setting up with Reflect against the second. In round two, with the addition of Substitute, I'm gonna be following the old hope for rock tombs and not earthquakes while I set up to plus two trope. You know that one. Steelix cooperates today, and we get our plus two without issue. Then, with our speed intact, we can dismantle Bruno's team. Raikou is just too good. Bruno was a sticky one last time, but Agatha was certainly not. In this battle again, with our massive speed stat and substitute, we can eliminate almost the entire threat that Agatha generally poses. Once again, I only need to set up to plus two for the victory here, keeping in line with needing about half as much setup as Suicune so far. It's another easy victory for Raikou, Lance is next. Well, we've already seen what Substitute does to Lance in round two, so all I really have to talk about here is how I need to set up to plus three, the highest that Raikou has needed all run so far. Many of these battles in round one were similar, but just like with Suicune, we were able to rely more on our raw damage output than needing a ton of setup. I hope that these battles haven't been sped up too much, but really, we're running three extremely similar Pokemon. Is it a wonder that they landed on similar strategies? After an electrifying league, it's time to face that round two champion again. We're at the whims of Heracross's mood again, this time with an even more likely chance that he'll go for Earthquake since we're weak to it. He's mildly cooperative, but that's honestly all I needed from him. 
were able to get to plus three before striking him down. Gyarados, Charizard, Tyranitar, and Alakazam all fall in quick succession to the power of our Thunder Beast. Against Exeggutor though, I make another move choice error. I know I won't one-shot, so I go to set up a decoy and avoid Sleep Powder. Instead, I misclick on Calm Mind so we get put to sleep. Uh-oh. Thankfully, with our setup, Exeggutor can't do a ton of damage to us, so despite my nerves being increasingly shot and my palms being so sweaty that I could barely hold onto the controller, we finally wake up and end the battle. Well, that's two champion battles and two costly move choice mistakes on my part. Maybe I won't mess up with Entei? Tell me that my shortcomings aren't what's going to determine this race. Raikou clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 18 minutes, and 46 seconds at level 73 with 6 resets. This took 4 hours and 49 minutes of game time. Alright Entei, show me what you got. In the little blank space on my overlay, I'm going to keep Raikou and Suicune's times posted. Raikou managed to edge out Suicune by 1 minute and 45 seconds, and it's all down to Entei now. The one who struggled most last run, but has showed the most improvement so far. Before entering the league, I used my last three rare candies with Entei to level us to 69. Nice. Just like Suicune, Entei is going to need plus four to be successful in this first battle. I don't quite get it against Dugong, but then I grab my last bit of setup against Cloyster, who isn't really that threatening. Lorelei falls, bringing on Big Bad Bruno. He's not necessarily going to be more difficult for Entei here, but it gives me a chance to explain the fire type's disadvantage again. Steelix's main options against us are Rock Tomb to lower our speed and Earthquake, well, to hurt us. He's using them about evenly, but Entei's weakness to rock and ground puts us in a bit more of a precarious situation. You'll see more about that in a second. At least in Bruno's battle, we're able to get our plus two matching Raikou's setup and bring down his team. We miss the one shot against Machamp, but bring him down on the next turn. I knew that was a range. For the amount of trouble that Agatha has presented for other Pokémon, none of these three find much challenge with her with the power of decoys. I made the mistake of only going to plus one, which honestly could have handled most of her team, but Arbok survives, so I set up with one additional Calm Mind while she heals, and we can finish the battle from there. See, I told you the extra setup for Raikou was about Arbok. The absolute bane of Entei's last run is Lance, but as we've seen in the other two runs, round two Lance has a bit of a flaw. It's this battle and the champion that I considered most heavily for our hidden power typing. As I mentioned, Dragon was the top contender for the longest time simply because it hits pretty much everything for neutral damage and is super effective in this battle. When I made the decision to do substrats, that shifted to Water, Electric, Grass, or Psychic. Psychic was the next best, but didn't really provide any advantage over neutral or resisted flamethrowers. Electric thing hung around for a little while, thinking about this Gyarados and Aerodactyl, but with our setup behind a decoy, do we need it? That left water and grass. The three factors that really determined this for me were Tyranitar, Blastoise, and Kingdra, actually. Grass is super effective against both champ problems and hits Kingdra for neutral, whereas water would have left me with two quad-resisted moves against it. I thought it would be fun to break down my thinking a little bit on that one. Do you agree with what I did? I mean, it seems to be working. Lance is out of here, leaving one final battle in the video where everything is going to be decided. For the third time, we're going to be entirely at the whim of his lead Heracross. But Entei has a problem that I did not foresee. Again, with the power of hindsight, I should have invested in our defense more earlier in this run. The reason for this is that Heracross is stronger than Bruno Steelix, and his rock tombs are within range of knocking out our decoys in a single shot. Not every time, but that's a big problem when we're already hoping for his cooperation. I can't get the plus three setup that I need here, and we fall to Tyranitar after missing the one shot with HP Grass. Sometimes too, Heracross is just going to sit there spamming earthquakes. In those situations, there isn't a thing I can do except for slowly watch our health tick down while our time ticks up. As we wipe here, I see the hope for victory fade, surpassing Raikou's finish time. Oh, by the way, even when we manage to get to plus three, Tyranitar is a range. A favorable one, but a range nonetheless. It takes us four attempts to find a successful one. I manage, though not without a fair amount of difficulty, to get in my plus three against Heracross. We're under half health, but set up. Come on, damage range against Tyranitar, yes! Okay, let's see the rest of the battle. I was half tempted to set up once and allow Blastoise to set up the rain, cancelling the sandstorm, but I didn't trust the range of this hydro pump going for the knockout instead. Plus three stab flamethrower, sometimes super effective, take out his remaining Pokemon. Against Arcanine, we only have resisted moves, so he gets in some more extreme speeds, bringing us down to a not-so-comfortable 29 health, but that is a victory. 
That champion battle was a little rough to say the least. I'd hoped for one additional rare candy from our Meowths, but it just wasn't to be today, so that plus three on Tyranitar being a range and having a slightly lower defense stat ended up really sucking. Entei clocks in with a round two time of 1 hour, 21 minutes, and 10 seconds at level 72 with 8 resets. This took 4 hours and 53 minutes of game time. Oh, excuse me as I switch back to Suicune footage. This was the only one that I captured credits with. Whoops. What a race that was. Let's see how our final splits compare. We'll start with the race winner, Raikou. That cursed initial portion of the run made for quite a bit of time loss in the early game, including a little bit of routing changing. Those changes in routing and getting early access to HP water sure helped mitigate that cursed start, gaining big chunks of time near the end of the gym challenge, saving nearly 11 minutes by the end of round one, with a total time save in round two of 25 minutes and 59 seconds, finishing 5 levels lower with 30 less resets. Our next finish was Suicune, who saved time all run. They played incredibly intuitively, only needing to make a few minor adjustments through the early and mid games. Nothing much at all was significantly tweaked until we were heading into round 2 when we swapped out for HP Electric and Substrats. I think most of our early time saves were likely due to Chesto Berries. We end up clearing round 1 a little over 9 minutes faster, saving 17 minutes and 15 seconds at the end of round 2, at the same level with 22 less resets. We ended up clocking in only 30 nine seconds behind Raikou. Finally, Entei, who required the most changes to be successful. Being able to defeat Misty on the first pass created some massive time fluctuations in Entei splits, but the trend was overall gaining time. That trend continues, saving over ten and a half minutes by the end of the gym challenge, but that kind of pales in comparison to our later time saves. Eighteen minutes at the end of round one, and a whopping forty minutes and thirteen seconds at the end of round two, six levels lower with forty-eight less resets. We ended up one minute and forty-five seconds behind Suicune and two minutes and twenty-four seconds behind Raikou, most of which was because of that darn Heracross. I've remade the tier list and there's definitely some room for improvement. I'm thinking about splitting my verses and solo series completions now because that verses cluster around the 1 hour 20 mark is getting a little crowded already. Raikou, Suicune, and Entei all find themselves ahead of the pack but still behind the Gen 3 box art legendaries. Since legendaries don't have access to egg moves, that's why I put them among the solo results. Let me know what you think of the new graphic. There are some tweaks to be made for sure, but at least we have something that we were lacking in the last one. Room to grow. I also want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel via YouTube memberships, Patreon, and Super Chat. You keep me motivated to continue working hard to bring you the best content that I possibly can. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. And thank you, loyal viewer, for making it to the end of the video. This project ended up being much bigger than I anticipated, but I hope that I covered the Gen 2 beasts in a fair and comprehensive way. Do you agree with what I did? How would you have optimized these beasts? I'd love to hear about it in the comments. While you're there, if you feel like I've earned it, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. I have a goal of reaching 5,000 subs by 2024, and your engagement really helps. Also, golly, it feels good to be rocking a smooth egg again after a month of not shaving. And and that is a wrap. If I don't see you at Tuesday's stream, I'll see you next week for another exceptional video. Until next time, take care everyone.